Did you know that Luffy once picked his nose and wiped it on Usopp's arm? Here he is in chapter 604 picking said nose. Then we cut to a panel of Usopp with Luffy's finger sneakily present in the bottom right here. Then later on we have this panel of Usopp complete with Booger on arm. Apparently Oda was laughing uncontrollably whilst drawing this and it took fans literally years to notice. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. And today we are going to zero in on some small yet mind blowing details that get frequently overlooked in One Piece. Because one of the factors that fans often identify as something that really really separates One Piece from other manga or anime series is Oda's sheer attention to detail in every respect, be it characters, the world, or the story itself. And I'm also going to go out on a limb here and say that even people who make that claim have probably missed half of the mind-blowing details that I'm going to share here. The layers of One Piece just go so much deeper than even a lot of hardcore fans realize. And if you keep digging and digging, you will simply continue to find stuff like some sort of narrative Minecraft. However, in order to dig to that depth, you're going to need this handy subscribe button for the Grand Line Review, which can act as a travel as well as a gateway for regular One Piece content being uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. And please do say hi in the comments below if you're a new member of the Grand Fleet. Oh, and also if you have a mind blowing detail that you do not see here today, please do throw it in the comments as well. Because this is One Piece after all, and I'm certain that I won't come anywhere near close to highlighting everything that deserves recognition. But we are going to begin with one of my personal favorite overlooked details in One Piece, which is that Madame Charlie is actually Arlong's sister. Or more accurately, Arlong's half sister, but still. This is one of those fun connections that just just goes completely unnoticed by the fan base at large. And of course they do have strikingly similar aesthetics, both being based on a brand of shark, even though one is a mermaid and one is a fishman. These two have a fairly tragic past though, as Arlong was abandoned in the fishman district as a child, but when he was 15, a man, a fish man to be precise, claiming to be his father appeared out of nowhere with a very young Charlie, who of course was born from a different mother, which obviously makes Charlie the youngest sibling who is 29 in modern day, whilst Arlong is 41, which means that he is probably entering his fishman midlife crisis. And it's not like this is something that was revealed in just external media either, because in the series, Hody Jones blatantly refers to Arlong as Charlie's brother, so it is simply an overlooked fact. Next up, we have some more meta detail, but have you ever noticed that Luffy is the only straw hat whose thoughts we almost never hear? Either with a thought bubble in the manga or through some sort of inner monologue in the anime, whatever the case, these devices don't generally get used with Luffy all that often, and it's because in the words of Echiro Oda, if he's thinking it, he'll say it. Actions speak louder than words. So the idea is that Luffy having thoughts would be redundant because he would just say whatever he's thinking anyway. And Oda's general mantra regarding Luffy is that he will act before he thinks. With that said, Oda does break this from time to time, and one notable occasion would be when Luffy was infiltrating Impel Down. He had a lot of inner monologues happening here, assumedly to be all stealthy and such, although that still didn't stop him from blurting out statements that he probably should have kept within his brain thing. But if you do ever catch Luffy having a thought, just pause for a second and appreciate how ridiculously rare that is in One Piece. Now our next small detail is going to concern Chopper's hat. Because following the time skip, one of the things that shocked me most initially was that Chopper had a new hat at all because his old one meant so much for him. It would be like if Luffy just abandoned his straw hat for another hat that looked a bit more schmick. However, thankfully that is not the case. Chopper's old hat is still here, but it has a new spherical covering. So it's more like Chopper made a modification to his old hat and that made me feel a lot better when I found out. But moving on with another of my favorite overlooked details, and this one is pretty ridiculous and nigh on impossible to pick up on, but have you ever noticed Notice the feud between Yasop of the Red Hair Pirates and Vista of the Whitebeard Pirates. And if you answered no, I don't really blame you, but it does exist. It only gets displayed on one occasion in the manga, and initially your eyes probably skip over them completely because the dominant focus is Shanks and the sub focus is Marco. But there's a detailed tertiary story going on here if we zoom in to catch Yasop and Vista glaring at each other with these unforgivable eyes. It's a little detail that was completely omitted from the anime for whatever reason, but it's not just pure speculation either because in the Blue Deep data book, it is confirmed that something happened in the past between Yasop and Vista to have caused this reaction here today. It actually kind of reminds me of the whole Zoro Sanji dynamic, but whatever it is, we have some history to explore here. But while we're focused on the past, let's go all the way back to chapter one. And have you heard of a character named Minotomo? He probably looks very familiar these days, but he was created as a joke character to explain how Higuma and his bandits broke the door of Makino's bar when they entered and how it was magically fixed by the time they left. And apparently it was Minotomo who fixed the door off screen by the time the bandits left. But this joke character would go on to make a canon appearance during the Wano arc as the leader of the Carpenter's Guild that Frankie joined. Except it's not Minotomo, except it is. It's weird. This guy's name is also Minotomo, but he's not the same Minotomo as the one we knew in East Blue. Although they are related and the East Blue Minotomo got to that part of the world by traveling from Wano, more than likely with another group of Wano travelers being the founders of Shimotsuki Village where Zoro grew up. And while we're on the topic of Wano, there's another very recently overlooked detail 
tale on that island because did you know that Tengu Yama's teapot is in fact a devil fruit user? And you might because I did recently feature this raccoon fruit on the list of worst devil fruits in the series and it did get some extended focus in the anime. But yes, this is yet another example of an object in the series that has somehow quote unquote eaten a devil fruit. Which is very fascinating because Wano is an isolated country so not only do they have no idea what devil fruits actually are, but to have figured out even accidentally how to imbue them into objects is an impressive feat because that is one of Vegapunk's grand achievements in the outside world. And Wano is a very surprising hotspot for devil fruits as well, not just Zoan fruits either, because did you know that Kinemon, Kandro, and Raizo are all Paramecia type devil fruit users? Their abilities do often get mistaken as some sort of ninjutsu, which makes sense in the case of Raizo and Raizo alone, but they are all fruit users. Although we still have yet to find out how most of them got those fruits. Meanwhile, stepping back in One Piece, another small detail that people often miss is that Miss Golden Leak is not a Devil Fruit user. Her abilities are more like a form of pure hypnosis by using her skills as a realist painter in order to manipulate people's emotions and behaviors. And many readers or watchers just assume that this is a Devil Fruit ability, which is fair enough. There's no reason why it couldn't theoretically exist as one. But Oda did confirm in an SPS that Miss Golden Leak, or Marianne, which is her real name, is not a fruit wielder. But there is still a lot of confusion in the fan base, a lot of which probably stems from some bad translation of this page here, where Vivi states that most officer agents of Baroque Works do indeed have fruit powers. Emphasis on the word most, which in many of the scans has been translated as all. But yeah, Miss Golden Week is just a unique power user, which does sometimes happen in One Piece. As for more unique situations, I'm sure it struck most of you as a bit weird at some point that level 5.5 even existed in Impel Down to begin with, completely unnoticed by Ward Magellan or, well, anyone really. But here is a very, very cool detail. We actually know who created level 5.5, and it is none other than Morley, the Revolutionary Army Commander of the West Army. And he was able to do it with his Devil Fruit, the Oshi Oshi no Mi, which allows him to push and shape ground surfaces as he sees fit. So he actually manipulated level 5.5 into existence, but this does get a bit weirder because Morley did not do this for the benefit of the Revolutionary Army in which he is now a member of. In fact, it was done about 100 years before One Piece even began because Morley is a 160 year old giant who was once a fairly evil pirate and thus imprisoned in Impel Down. Although thanks to his ability, he escaped without notice, mind you, meaning that he was actually the first character to officially escape from Impel Down and not Golden Lion Shiki. And then Emporio Ivankov, almost a century later, would adopt the space and turn it into Newcomer Land. And according to Oda, Ivankov still doesn't know that it was Morley who created level 5.5, but that is how it came to be. Meanwhile, have you ever noticed that in the more recent days of One Piece, Nika Robin tends to call people by the names that Luffy gives them? This is one of those things that went completely over my head for quite some time, but when it comes to characters like, say, Cavendish or Bartolomeo, Robin will refer to them as Cabbage and Rooster, which are the names that Luffy gave them. And in this weird way, it shows that Robin and Luffy share a sliver of wavelength because Robin understands how Luffy thinks, which was also shown when she reminded him of who Marco was by pointing out that he was the one who looked like a pineapple, which was pretty adorable. And I just enjoy that Robin is able to see what Luffy sees. It's a very special dynamic that the two of them have. Here's another fun one though. We all remember Dellinger from Dress Rosa, yeah? Well, first up, he's half Fishman, which is something that goes unnoticed a fair bit, quite surprisingly. But one layer deeper, another detailed aspect regarding Dellinger is that he was raised by Jola. I mean, the Don Quixote family were a fairly cohesive unit, but after discovering an abandoned baby Dellinger, it was Jola who took on the bulk of responsibilities in regards to raising him. Which is why Oda explains that Jola's taste in art and style have very much been imprinted on Dellinger, hence his utterly fabulous existence. Now here's a simultaneously more recent yet historical detail. Because within One Piece, the very first straw hat to invoke any sort of haki was in fact, Zoro. And he did this during his fight against Mr. One on Alabasta, because with the benefit of more recent information, we do know that the Breath of All Things is in fact a very Wano-esque explanation of Haki use. The tricky thing is determining exactly what sort of Haki use it is, because the ability to cut steel via the Shishi Sonson technique would imply that Zoro may actually be using advanced armor Haki rather than the more standard brand, which isn't entirely unheard of. There are characters in the series who have been shown using the advanced application without necessarily understanding the basics. But what we do know for a fact is that Zoro was using Haki way, way, way back on Alabasta. He just followed the path of the samurai to get there as opposed to learning via the standard methodology. And here is our ultimate overlooked detail for this video. As we all know, One Piece is a series about pirates, all kinds of pirates, and we've been showcasing them for well over two decades now. However, one thing that you may not have noticed because it isn't there, I suppose, is that there has never been a single pirate in One Piece with an eye patch. We've seen every other standard pirate feature, be it a bandana, a peg leg, flint lock pistols, missing teeth, or just loads and loads of alcohol, but never an eye patch. And this is very purposeful as revealed by Oda 
Oda in the One Piece 10th Treasures magazine. It's not that Oda doesn't like eye patches, it's that to him, the eye patch is the ultimate symbol of a pirate. And apparently towards the end of One Piece, there will be a pirate appearing with an eye patch, who many have interpreted as being Luffy. Because Oda also talks about wanting to draw the journey of a pirate getting to that stereotypical look, but that's obviously far from confirmed. I personally think that Blackbeard is also a pretty strong contender because he has all the other hallmarks of a pirate stereotype, but we'll see. It's just kind of fascinating though that for a series that explores piracy into such depth, Oda has never drawn one of the most recognizable symbols of a pirate. But what do you guys think? Please do leave your thoughts in the comments below or even join my Discord server. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, then please do go and check out some of my other content or even subscribe to the channel for more glorious One Piece business uploaded straight into your YouTube feeds. But for now, this has been the Grand Line Review and I'll see you next time.